the rise of apostasy. People are leaving Islam at unprecedented rates. The narrative of Islam being the fastest growing religion is no longer true. The Muslim community is now in damage control from this new threat. Dr. Bilal Phillips in a recent Friday sermon openly has warned the Muslim community that apostasy will come like a tsunami. And if we don't take constructive steps to deal with this, it is going to become an avalanche, a tsunami that is going to hit our community in such a way that we will have a very difficult time standing. It will knock us over. The tides are turning. In real life, I know many people who have left Islam, but the majority cannot come out publicly due to family pressure, social pressure, and community pressure. The number of ex-Muslims who are out is still a very small number. I personally know many individuals who admitted to me that they left Islam but cannot come out in the open. They cannot even tell their own brother or sister. They cannot tell their mom and dad. Some of them can't even tell their wife. Recently, an online conference was organized by 10 leading Islamic preachers to discuss the problem and tackle it. This is something I've never seen before growing up as a Muslim. Courses like this were unheard of. There's statistics as well to, black, to back up these claims. Bashir Muhammad, senior researcher at Pew, has stated that 23% of American Muslims no longer identify as Muslim. This means that as many people are leaving Islam as converting to it right now, for Christianity, which has gone through a reform long ago, it's a net loss, with more people leaving it than converting to it. According to a post in National Geographic, the fastest growing religion is no religion. The religiously unaffiliated, called nuns, are growing significantly. They're the second largest religious group in North America and most of Europe. In the United States, nuns make up almost a quarter of the population. Now, even though this isn't, un isn't usually advertised, Muslim scholars and imams know this to be the case. Muslim scholars are usually at the forefront of seeing this happen because parents will come and complain that the child is not religious or even doesn't believe any longer. Some trusted scholarly individual will usually be contacted by someone in the community seeking help for their family member. Let's listen to Bilal Phillips talk about this major issue. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> in today's khutbah, I would like to stress two main points, which I have seen with my own eyes and heard with my own ears, the consequence of failing to achieve. The Muslim community here, in a minority circumstance, is a high-risk community. Back home in our countries, where people grow up practicing Islam, as a culture, as tradition, everybody conforms because of the pressure of the community, the relatives, etc. It is rare that you would find back home a young man or a young woman addressing their parents, their family, and telling them, I don't believe in Allah. I don't believe that Muhammad وسلم, was a messenger of Allah. I don't believe that the Quran is a book of revelation. That is unthinkable. 
That is the unthinkable back home. But here in Canada, it is happening. It is happening continuously. You may not find it coming from small children, young children, but it is happening at different stages of adulthood, early adulthood, teenage, it is happening. Because our young ones, our children are at risk. Their faith is being challenged in the society and particularly in the schools, in the institutions of education. This is where their faith is challenged. We cannot afford to be complacent. Back home, yes, we could be complacent. Because the society is there as a safety net to catch those that may slip, doubt, etc., and help them back. But here, there is no safety net. There's a family, but the family is not enough. So basically, Islam can survive criticism and doubt when everyone around you is Muslim. The reality, though, is even in the heart of Muslim countries, people are quietly leaving Islam. While I was in Doha, Qatar, one sister called me from here. From a religious practicing family, Islamically active, she said, my son memorized the Quran at the age of 10. Alhamdulillah. He memorized the Quran at the age of 10. And he went for Umrah. We took him for Hajj. Praise, fast, everything. But at the age of 15, five years later, she's calling. She said he came home and told us that he doesn't believe in Allah. What should we do? We have other young children in the house. Should we kick him out? Because he could possibly affect the rest of the family members, the younger ones. He could infect them. This is a disease. What should I do? I advised her to take him to the local imam or some knowledgeable individuals from the community here to discuss with him and try to help him find his way back. It's a tragic situation. Kicking out a 15-year-old because he left Islam? Wow. And a few days ago, I met with another young man from our community who completed his bachelor's degree in the University of Toronto, doing his master's, science subjects, etc. And he reached the same point. He said, I don't believe in Allah. His family members brought him for me to talk to him. And I spoke with him. He didn't believe in Allah. Uh, he 
spoke something of, yeah, well, no, I do believe in God, but in the end, when I pinned him down, he didn't believe in the existence of God. The Quran was not a miracle. Muhammad وسلم, was not a prophet of God. Yes, he's a good man. He was a good man. He was known as a good man. But as he said, good people lie. Good people can lie, just like anybody else. That's where he reached. The issue is, this could happen to any of you. This could happen to any one of you. That brother who I spoke to a few days back, his family is a practicing Muslim family. Active Islamically. And the one who called me from here, same thing. So it's not just a matter of uh, those people were not good Muslims, they weren't really practicing, so and so and so. So it's not surprising. No. This is really serious. This is something that we all face. All of us who have children who are going to these institutions and you never know when it can happen. I remember when I was here in 2012 the same thing another family told me you know here our daughter she doesn't want to pray. She's going to university now. She wants to take off her hijab. But, you know, this was an active practicing family. When I spoke to the young lady, she said, actually, I had stopped praying from way back. Mom didn't realize it. Uh, she would pray on some occasions, but as establishing the prayer, it was gone. Belief was gone. She was just maintaining a front for her mother. These stories are typical. Everybody knows someone who has left Islam now, at least one person in the circle of friends or family, even from religious families. Nobody is safe. Now, the next issue. Preachers even go out of the way to warn Muslims that studying Islam in Western academia can cause one to lose their faith. Let's listen to what Noman Ali Khan has to say about what happened to his friend. For example, I, I know brothers that, uh, you know, their intention was they're going to study Islam in the Muslim world and then they're going to come here and they're going to do PhDs in Islamic studies in different universities, things like that. And they got into the, you know, one such program, for example, I have a friend who's in Harvard at the Islamic studies program. And I met him, in a, he was getting his master's, then he was going to get into his PhD, again, Islamic studies. He's not even done with his master's, I was just, I went to Boston and I was hanging out with him, and what, is, what does he tell me? He says, man, after the two semesters, I lost my faith. And the only way I can actually continue my studies, is that I, I stop thinking about it. Because if I think about it, I can't, I can't keep my iman anymore. It's gone. Yasir Qadi talks about how he personally got shubhat, doubts that he wasn't able to resolve studying Islam at Yale, doubts related to the history of Islam. I was one of the first people that doing a PhD from an Ivy League, now I have 10 years in Medina, I don't, still don't know anybody who's done something like this. I mean, and I'm being honest with you, you're all tulab al ilm and, 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 and have studied Islamic sciences. Wallahi, I'll be honest with you, the shubuhat that I was exposed to at Yale, some of them I still don't have answers for. The reason why many of our ulama are so scared to go into these fields is because they are not qualified to answer every single shubha. So there's an element of truth, like you don't throw your son or daughter in the water when they don't know how to swim. When my teachers at Medina found out I'm going to Yale, they expressed their concerns to me. You're going to go there, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. Many of them. And of course, I, I realized this is the way forward for me personally. 
alhamdulillah, one or two very forward-minded, very open-minded of my mentors, they appreciated this, they, they, they wanted me to go, alhamdulillah. Uh, but, honestly, it was not easy, because I jumped into the deep end, and I did Islamic studies, and early Islamic studies. And when you do that type of stuff, your brain really is scrambled completely. And you can, and the type of talk you just heard me give, I would never have given it in the Medina face. <laughs> it's not going to come because you, what, what the Western education does is it historicizes, contextualizes. Hmm? It forces you to rethink. You know, Medina, Azhar, Malaysia, Islamabad will build a building for you. When you go to Harvard, Princeton, Yale, they will deconstruct the entire building. Throw it all the way back down. It's going to be all blocks. Back to Lego blocks. Then you have to figure out how am I going to reconstruct it myself. They're not even going to do it for you. Right? This is the reality of, of the Western education. That you are forced to think. And you realize that that building I inherited from Azhar or Medina is not a building that Allah revealed. It's a building that is constructed over centuries. Did you hear what he said? Constructed over several centuries. Watch the latest video by Sharif Gabel called What You Don't Know About the Quran to see the type of arguments that are studied in these universities. And, and so what has happened, and I've seen this myself, many, uh, not Medina or Azhar graduates, but many practicing Muslims have gone into these programs and come out either agnostic or preaching a version of Islam that I find very unpalatable. If you understand what I'm saying, okay. Why is it they didn't go in wanting to become like this, but they felt they have enough tools to be able to deal with the shubhat, and they didn't. Muslim scholars purposely avoid talking about controversy and doubtful incidents. No emphasis is placed on issues like how the Quran was not written until long after Muhammad's death, or how there were huge disagreements over who would rule next. A lot of the Arab tribes that were supposedly united under Muhammad apostatized at his death and the later wars were fought to bring them back in line. The vast majority of Muslims are unaware of the holes in their religion. Not only that, even most Muslim scholars are unaware of these holes. And the reality that we have in our times demonstrates this. You have the most intelligent people in the world, by and large, denying God's existence. Most scientists in the world are agnostic and atheist. Because it's not purely there's an element, in fact, the predominant element, it's something that is filtering. Afillahi shak. That's really what it boils down to. I mean, how can you deny Allah? It's something Allah Azza wa put it in us. Yasir Qadi is arguing that belief in God is primarily not aqli, meaning based on reason, but is fitri, meaning something we are predisposed to. This is actually true scientifically. For example, we are predisposed to find patterns. We find patterns in the sky, for example. We see patterns in our prayer mats when we pray. In the dark, we sometimes fear something hiding in the closet because thousands of years of evolution meant that those who erred on the side of caution would have survived and thus passed on these tendencies. And so I think that we evolved. There was a natural selection for the propensity for our belief engines, our pattern-seeking brain processes to always find meaningful patterns and infuse them with these sort of predatory or intentional agencies that I'll come back to. So for example, what do you see here? It's a horse head, that's right. It looks like a horse, must be a horse, that's a pattern. And is it really a horse or is it more like a frog? See, our pattern detection device, which is, appears to be located in the uh, anterior cingulate cortex, it's our little sort of detection device there, can be easily fooled and this is the problem. For example, what do you see here? Yes, of course, it's a cow. Once I prime the brain, it's called cognitive priming. Once I prime the brain to see it, it pops back out again, even without the pattern that I've imposed on it. And what do you see here? Some people see a Dalmatian dog. Yes, there it is. And there's the prime. So when I go back, without the prime, your brain already has the model, so you can see it again. What do you see here? Planet Saturn. Yes, that's good. How about here? Just shout out anything you see. That's a good audience, Chris, because there's nothing in this. Well, allegedly, there's nothing. <laughs> we may also be predisposed to believe in God. I completely agree with Yasir Qadi here. 
Where I disagree is that this was placed in us by God. There are perfectly good naturalistic explanations we can use. In the book Sapiens by Yuval Harari, he explains that belief in a common cause, a common power, would have helped tribes survive. For example, the great spirit or whatever it may be. This might be why we are predisposed to believe in God, because it had survival benefit at some point. It doesn't make it right. Really, there is no good reason to believe in Allah, the God who is above the seven heavens who sent revelation to Muhammad. Whether there is a God or isn't, that is another discussion altogether. I personally don't think so. Regardless, I'm sure that Allah is a fictional character invented by Muhammad.